Now coming up to the conclusion of our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Let's take a romp around the ether and jump into that tropospheric duct over there as we find out what the stories are for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1236 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Delegates from the ARRL attend the International Amateur Radio Union General Assembly meetings. We will have a full report. The Australian Communications and Media Authority proposes to move amateurs in Australia to a class-based licensing system. Meanwhile, the German radio regulator, Binetza, proposes a new entry-level N, as a novice, class license. Amateurs help solve a police radio interference issue in Kolkata. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is looking for volunteers for its advisory committee. Hurricanes Lisa and Martin kept amateur radio operators busy. We will have all the details. After 32 years of publishing the popular Ohio Penn DX newsletter, its editor decides to retire. Have you contracted Potoxia? That's Parks on the Air. And their operation continues to climb in popularity. We will have the November Parks on the Air report. The governor of New York State issues broadband status reports to the FCC in hopes of getting broadband in underserved areas of the state. The third annual Youth Dream Rig Essay Contest is underway. We will tell you how you can qualify and enter. And we all look forward to retirement. But what about repeaters? We will tell you about a repeater that began service in the early 1960s and is now enjoying its retirement in the mountains while still remaining on the air. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about dark fiber and the cost of internet access in the U.S. And he will answer the questions, what is the internet phone book, the domain name service, and how do those dotted quad addresses work? Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, will explain his plan for distributed software-defined radio decoding and will take a look at how your antenna system is basically out of sight and often out of mind. Our own amateur radio historian Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back in time to look at the Radio Act of 1912 and the changes that came about when the Radio Act of 1927, which created and mentions for the first time amateur radio. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about what you should do when you climb a tower for another amateur or your friends and family. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. In our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where we are in the mid-70s, and it's sunny and warm, and it's November, I'm George, W2XBS. Where's the snow? And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Reporting from Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Who Radio. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it's more like summer than it is autumn, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau after an almost perfect fall week, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And back in studio, one of our central Thornton News Bureau, from my elongated vacation in upstate New York, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, an ARRL delegation led by President Rick Roderick, K5UR, as head of the delegation, and including Chief Executive Officer Dave Minster, NA2AA, have attended the International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 General Assembly this week. This year's meeting concluded on Friday, November 4th, 2022. 
ARRL International Affairs Vice President Rod Stafford, W6ROD, is also participating, serving as the Area B Director for Region 2. With more details on this important meeting, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. The Triennial General Assembly is the formal decision-making body of IARU Region 2, comprising the Americas, and delegates are the representatives of each member society. The president of the IARU Region 2 is Ramon Santoyo, XE1KK. The meetings began on October 31, 2022, with five evening sessions held virtually of approximately three hours each. The virtual meetings were necessary because of COVID and travel concerns. At the meetings, the delegates have reviewed challenges to amateur radio, debated proposals from member societies, and received reports from coordinators and elected volunteers. A selection will also be made for the host society of the next General Assembly in 2025. Having a virtual conference has allowed many of our societies with limited means to participate in the triennial governance process of IARU Region 2 for the first time, said IARU Region 2 Secretary George Goresline, VE3YVK8HI. 26 member societies are represented with 117 registered attendees from across Region 2, as well as representatives from Region 1, that's Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and Northern Asia, number three, Asia Pacific, and the IARU officers. The Wednesday evening committee reports were especially well received and stimulated much discussion. A full summary will be published after the General Assembly, including videos of each plenary session. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Having a virtual conference has allowed many of our societies with limited means to participate in the triennial governance process of the IARU Region 2 for the first time, said IARU Region 2 Secretary George Gorsline, VE3YV, stroke K8HI. 26 member societies are represented with 117 registered attendees from across Region 2, as well as representatives from Region 1, which includes Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Northern Asia, Region 3, which is Asia and the Pacific Region, and the IARU officers. The Wednesday evening committee reports were especially well received and stimulated much discussion. A full summary will be published after the General Assembly, including videos of each plenary session. The International Amateur Radio Union is the worldwide federation of national amateur radio organizations. AWRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio in the U.S., is a member society and IARU International Secretariat participating in matters that promote and protect the interests of the amateur radio service worldwide. Australia's radio communications regulator, the Australian Communication and Media Authority, or ACMA, is proposing to move the country's radio amateurs to a class license, which is intended to simplify administration of the amateur radio service. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with more information on what the Australian regulator is proposing. Currently, Australia's radio amateurs are regulated under an apparatus license with privileges and conditions set out in a radio communications license condition determination. Australian hams pay an annual license fee of $55, that's $35.68 in U.S. currency, but under the proposed class license, the annual license renewal payments would end. The ACMA reports that the current consultation follows extensive public feedback on the review of the non-assigned licensing arrangements conducted between February and April 2021. They intend to implement the proposed class licensing arrangements on July 1, 2023. The ACAMA's deadline for receiving responses is November 29, 2022. The Wireless Institute of Australia, WIA, is the national member organization representing the interest of Australian radio amateurs and is a member of the International Amateur Radio Union. The WIA's working group intends to open a survey in early November to gauge the views of the Australian radio amateur community. As this is going to be a quantum step in the evolution of amateur licensing in Australia, such as we have not seen previously, the details need close and careful consideration, said working group leader Peter Young, VK3MV. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The ACMA says they will carefully consider responses received to the current consultation. As stated in the consultation paper, subject to the outcomes of the current consultation and the implementation of supporting operational and administrative arrangements, the ACMA intends to implement the proposed class licensing arrangements on July 1, 2023. The review's principal objective 
was to identify the most appropriate licensing mechanism that would reduce regulatory burden and minimize costs for amateur radio operators while preserving the operational utility for amateurs. The Wireless Institute of Australia's working group intends to open a survey in early November to gauge the views of the Australian radio amateur community. Peter has been licensed since 1964 and has a background in maritime communications engineering. He is a former regional manager with the ACMA and, since retiring, held positions with the WIA as a director on the WIA board and a director with International Amateur Radio Union Region 3. The Wireless Institute of Australia is the national member organization representing the interests of Australian radio amateurs and is a member of the International Amateur Radio Union. The Wireless Institute of Australia has a well-credentialed working group developing their response to the ACMA's proposals. The Federal Communications Commission is reorganizing to better support the growing satellite industry by transforming the International Bureau into two entities, the Space Bureau and a standalone Office of International Affairs. According to the Commission, the separation of satellite policy from international policy acknowledges the role of satellite communications in advancing domestic communications policy and achieving U.S. broadband goals. In a press statement, FCC Chairman Jessica Rosenworcel shared that the agency has received applications for 64,000 new satellites, indicating just how much the sector is booming. It is true that the likes of SpaceX, Starlink, and even the top-tier carriers are ushering in a new era of satellite connectivity. As of last February, SpaceX, for instance, had around 2,000 satellites in its network, which plans to launch thousands more, potentially blanketing the planet in coverage. Currently, the FCC has granted SpaceX permission to launch up to 12,000 satellites. The satellite industry is growing at a record pace, said Rosenworcel, but here on the ground, our regulatory frameworks for licensing them have not kept up. We are seeing new commercial models, new players, and new technologies coming together to pioneer a wide range of new satellite services and space-based activities that need access to wireless airwaves. The reorganization, she continued, will ensure that the agency's resources are appropriately aligned to fulfill its statutory obligations, improve its coordination across the federal government, and support the 21st century satellite industry. The Commission licenses radio frequency uses by satellites and ensures that space systems reviewed by the agency have sufficient plans to mitigate orbital space debris under the authority of the Communications Act of 1934 as amended. By establishing a standalone Space Bureau, the agency aims to better fulfill its statutory obligations and elevate the significance of satellite programs and policy within the agency to a level that reflects the importance of the emerging space economy. While the Space Bureau will support advancing and improving space-based communications, the standalone Office of International Affairs will deal exclusively with matters of international communications regulation and licensing. Additionally, this structure emulates the successful models of offices such as the Office of Engineering and Technology and Office of General Counsel that allows for consistent expertise to be leveraged across all the bureaus with a nexus to international affairs, said the FCC. Germany's new N-Class entry-level license could be in place as early as January 1st of 2023. The possible addition, announced earlier this year, is being reviewed by the German regulator BNETZA, B-N-E-T-Z-A, as a way to add a third license class to the existing E, Novice, and A, full license classes. A change in the regulations would give the N-Class operators call signs with the prefix DN, Delta November, and the current DN call signs, which are used for training purposes under supervisions of a licensed ham, would be canceled on December 31st of this year to be replaced by the use of a DN forward slash prefix. The new entry level N class will grant privileges to use the two meter and 70 centimeter bands with up to 10 watts EIRP. The operator will be allowed to build and operate homemade equipment as long as it conforms to the regulations. It is possible that usage of the 10 meter band may also be added to the class N license at the end of 2023. 
The content of the license exam syllabus will also be changed to make them cumulative with the ability, it is hoped, to allow the taking of the Class N, Class E, and Class A exams in sequence to get a full license in one day of testing. The Class N exam will cover all legal regulations, operational rules, and a limited amount of technical knowledge questions. The Class E and A exams will then only cover additional, more technical theory questions, building on the knowledge of the previous level or levels. A group of major Hindu festivals are coming up to the autumn calendar, starting on Sunday, October 30th, and police officials in West Bengal, India, were once again struggling with their radios. Something was calling havoc with their handhelds during the autumn Hindu festival, and it appeared that VHF radio communications was again going to be nearly impossible for crowd control and security. This year, police took their radio dilemma to some local radio amateurs in West Bengal, the radio club. According to a report by the Indo-Asian News Service, the hams conducted a variety of tests. Ultimately, they noticed interference peaked when signals had to pass through areas where traditional holiday lights were being used to decorate the parks and gardens. With the help of physicist Pasupi Pandel, VU3ODQ, a club member, the hams determined the interference came from the strings of LEDs manufactured in China, which used cheap components. According to Deepak Chabrokti, VU3OKT, when they were illuminated, the LEDs emitted a noise on a frequency very close to the one the police radios were using. The hams recommended replacing the Chinese LEDs with the ones manufactured in India, which had different components, didn't seem to cause the same issue. According to Ambarish Nig Biwash, VU2JFA, that seemed to solve the problem in time for the festival. The Federal Communications Commission announced this week that it is opening a new window for applications under its Honors Engineer program. The one year developmental program may lead to a term or permanent appointment. The Commission is accepting applications from recent graduates with an engineering degree and current students graduating in December of 2022. Among the duties included in the job description is training to perform propagation analysis of terrestrial, satellite, and or airborne systems or evaluating the emissions characteristics of various transmitters to validate the coexistence with neighboring systems. Projects may also involve various computer software engineering and scientific applications. An FCC news release describes that honors engineers will work alongside senior staffs on projects including developing technical rules and policy approaches to enable the U.S. to introduce new communications technologies and services such as 5G, 6G, advanced Wi-Fi, the Internet of Things, next-generation TV broadcasting, and new broadband satellite systems, facilitating wireless and wireline broadband service deployment throughout the nation, including to rural and underserved areas identifying technologies to improve access to communication services for all Americans, especially those with disabilities, enabling public safety and homeland security agencies, as well as various enterprises within various market sectors, such as healthcare, energy, education, and transportation to introduce new communication technologies and developing policies that encourage innovation and investment in and transition to new communication technologies, devices, and services that will support job creation and economic growth. Engineers are deployed throughout the FCC and from space innovation to new broadcast standards to 6G and beyond. The FCC's policy portfolio is filled with interesting and challenging engineering work, said FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. Our Honors Engineer Program is a unique opportunity for the newest engineers to work closely with experienced professionals in this field to ensure that the FCC is best prepared to face the challenges of next-generation communication networks. The announcement will close once 175 applications have been received or on December 2, 2022, whichever occurs first. Visit USA Jobs for the complete position summary and to apply at www.usajobs.gov. Garth Crow, WY7GC, was appointed as the new ARRL Wyoming Section Manager on October 12, 2022. He replaced Rick Brenninger, N1TEK, who announced he was stepping down following the Rocky Mountain Division Convention held in early October. Brenninger served as the Wyoming Section Manager since April 2019. 
ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, officially appointed Crow after consultation with Rocky Mountain Division Director Jeff Ryan, K0RM. Crow previously served as Wyoming Section Manager from 2009 until 2015. He will now serve for the remaining portion of Brenninger's term, which runs through March 31, 2023. Nominating petitions for the next Wyoming Section Manager term of office, beginning April 1, 2023, are due at ARRL headquarters no later than December 9, 2022. Visit Section Manager terms and nomination information on the ARRL website for more details. The Wyoming section is part of the ARRL Rocky Mountain Division, which includes Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah. Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, is looking for volunteers for its 2023 Grants Advisory Committee and Technical Advisory Committee. The Grants Advisory Committee reviews proposals submitted by organizations seeking ARDC grants. The committee usually meets twice a month for at least an hour with additional time spent reviewing proposals and email correspondences that happen between meetings. The estimated time commitment from a volunteer on this committee is about two to five hours per week. The Technical Advisory Committee advises ARDC's staff and board on 44 net technology, architecture, and policy. The TAC usually meets once or twice a month for at least an hour. Additional time may be spent working on or attending meetings related to projects such as refining 44 net use cases and standards, developing a new 44 net portal, and developing a proposal for points of presence. If you're interested in joining either committee, please send a resume and brief cover letter to contact at ardc.net by November 12, 2022. For more information on the Grants Advisory Committee, go to www.ampr.org forward slash now hyphen accepting hyphen applications hyphen for hyphen grants hyphen advisory hyphen committee. For more information on the Technical Advisory Committee, go to www.ampr.org forward slash now hyphen accepting hyphen applications hyphen for hyphen the hyphen 2023 hyphen technical hyphen advisory hyphen committee. Amateur radio operators were closely monitoring hurricane and weather nets as two tropical storms in the eastern and southwest Atlantic were upgraded to hurricane status late Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022. With more details on these storms, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, at League Headquarters. Hurricane Lisa made landfall late Wednesday in the Central American nation of Belize, near Belize City, and the town of Dangria with 60 mile per hour winds and heavy rain. The hurricane has now been downgraded to a tropical storm, but a state of emergency has been issued and remains in effect. Meanwhile, Hurricane Martin in the eastern Atlantic has also been downgraded to a tropical storm. The National Hurricane Center is predicting that Martin will become a large and powerful post-tropical cyclone by late Thursday, November 3rd, 2022. The Hurricane Watch Net was activated late Wednesday morning on 1 on 14.325 and later on 7.268 megahertz. The VOIP Hurricane Net was also activated, and as of early Thursday morning, both nets are in standby mode. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Amateur radio operators will continue to monitor the hurricane and weather nets to be ready if help is needed. Ted Mergliata, KV8NW, has retired from his role as the editor of the Ohio Penn DX News Bulletin. Mergliata has written the Internet publication for 32 years. He started on a local radio teletype bulletin board system and moved to a packet BBS, an online dial-up BBS voice and data system, before adding the internet. After 32 years of publishing the free Ohio Penn DX Bulletin, Ted Mergliata, KB8NW, is calling it quits. Ted, the president of the Northern Ohio DX Association, has made his free resource available on the internet and packet clusters around the world. He announced that the edition of the October 31st, 2022 was to be the last final bulletin. The bulletin's webmaster, John Pepe, K8YSE, said on the website that the archived issues of the bulletin will continue to be available on the EIDX network, papays.com. That's P-A-P-A-Y-S dot com. 
John said that readers enjoyed it as an email or as the list servers. He said that thousands of readers saw it on the website as well. What I found surprising is that people will not only read the current OPDX newsletter, but as they read back issues of the hundreds as well. What a great resource it has become and still will be. John encouraged people to email Ted and thank him for his years of de-expedition reports, propagation updates, and other relevant information. The email address is kb8nw at awrl.net. The last 42 years has been fun, said Mergliata. He's retiring because of age and health considerations. I'm happy to say that the Ohio Pen DX News Bulletin has been totally free for all those years, with no ads, no games, no hyperboasting, and no requests for donations. But there have been very few unsolicited donations. Thanks to those donors, said Mergliata. Mergliata wished all of his friends and supporters good luck and good DX. For additional information, visit the Ohio Pen DX News Bulletin website. With the past few months bringing great weather for outdoor activations, parks on the air QSOs have grown by a high percentage. Matt here, N3NWV, brings us the latest statistics. Hi everyone, I'm Matt, N3NWV, here with your October 2022 POTUS stats and news update. October included the fall Support Your Parks weekend event, and the stats show a big jump from last month. We had 15,781 activations by 2,808 activators from 5,483 parks. 47 DXCC entities were represented this month, and we reached a total of 706,846 CUSOs, a month-over-month -month increase of 29%. Congratulations to all of our category leaders for October, and as always, a big thank you to everyone who participates in the POTA program. Speaking of participating, our Park-A-Day Bailey Sprott list hasn't changed notably this month. We still have five activators and two dozen hunters on track for pressing the POTA button every day in 2022. Good luck to all now that we're down to the final two months of the year. The October 15th and 16th Support Your Parks weekend was a huge success, generating over 100,000 CUSOs. Nearly 1,100 activators got to over 1,500 parks and worked over 15,000 hunters. All in all, 34 DXCC entities participated in the weekend one way or another. That wraps it up for this month. 7-3 and POTA on. Students from the Crop Protection Student Association at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez participated in a communications practice session as part of the yearly Great Puerto Rico Shakeout Drill on October 20th, 2022. International Shakeout Day draws millions of people worldwide to participate in earthquake drills at work, school, or home. To tell us a little more about International Shakeout Day, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. ARRL Puerto Rico Section Assistant Manager Leda Rios, WP4RBK, presented a conference entitled Radio Services and the Great Shakeout, which provided service and hands-on activities about how to use different personal radio services in the event of an earthquake. Staff members and students learned about the amateur radio service and several other radio services as well. Participants had the opportunity to talk with several amateurs using simplex frequencies and repeaters. Many were interested in learning more about radio communications, and the event answered questions about how amateur radio can assist during emergencies when other means of communications fail. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The drill was attended by students and staff members. Information on how to obtain an amateur radio license and where to obtain radio equipment was also available. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Veterans Day is Friday, November 11th, 2022, and will feature many opportunities for amateur radio operators to celebrate and honor veterans throughout the holiday weekend. Special event stations will be on the air across the country, including the Reading Veterans Amateur Radio Club, W6VET in Reading, California, and the Veterans Day commemoration on board the USS Kidd, DD661, a World War II Fletcher class destroyer, with the USS Kidd Amateur Radio Club in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
The Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum in Ashland, Nebraska, has a full day of activities planned on November 11th, including an amateur radio demonstration by the Strategic Air Command Memorial Amateur Radio Club, using the historic call signs of General Curtis Emerson LeMay, K0GRL, and the Offutt Air Force Base, K0AIR. The American Legion Amateur Radio Club, K9TAL, is located at their national headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. Any station that contacts K9TAL on Veterans Day will receive a special QSL card. The Wisconsin Maritime Museum in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, will celebrate Veterans Day on November 12th and 13th, 2022. The USS Cobia Amateur Radio Club will be on board and on the air from the USS Cobia World War II submarine. A commemorative QSL card will be issued for contacts made during the two-day event. A complete list of special event stations, including Veterans Day stations, is available at www.arrl.org forward slash special hyphen event hyphen stations. That's www dot a r r l dot org forward slash special hyphen event hyphen stations use veterans in the keyword search a double r l headquarters will be closed on friday november 11th in observance of veterans day there won't be a w1 a w bulletin or code practice transmissions on that day a double r l headquarters will reopen on Monday, November 14th at 8 a.m. EST. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. We had quite a drama last week because uh, an electrical fire cut the fiber line between us and the outside world. It feels like we're, we're living in igloo in... Uh, in uh, the great frozen north, but in fact, we are in just Petaluma, Northern California, in the in the wine country. But the fiber line that connected uh, our town with uh, the big city, <laughs> San Rafael, and Marin County, the big city, and from there on to the bigger city, and I'm sure the rest of the world, got an electrical fire, and uh, that's it. there was a I didn't know, but that's a lot of fiber, 216 strands of fiber between us and San Rafael. That's a lot of fiber. That's enough bandwidth to probably serve the whole world. I don't know why there's so much fiber. Actually, we're kind of all benefiting from the big bubble of uh, 1999, believe it or not. There's a arm of economic theory about booms and busts. And uh, we had one, of course, uh, the great internet of 1999 2000 there was a lot of crazy investment in the internet remember that pets.com and you know site and, and you know in hindsight probably a lot of those businesses would be doing fine today but maybe they were too early or whatever when you get a when you get a uh, what was it uh, the chairman of the fed called it irrational exuberance people over invest and the values skyrocket nothing like anything that's going on today but uh <clears throat> But it all went crash in 2000. But we benefit from that because uh, in the late 90s, huge amounts of the money that was taken from investors went to building infrastructure and particularly fiber optics. And so there's a huge amount of fiber optic, high speed glass. This is a glass cable that carries so much more uh, data than the copper cables that we, we've kind of been used to. And because everybody was making the assumption, the irrationally exuberant assumption that the internet was going to trans, transform the world, uh, they put in a lot of fiber optic cable. If you look at the uh, Wikipedia article for optical fiber, you'll see a fiber crew installing a 432 count, twice as big cable underneath the streets of Midtown Manhattan. And it doesn't look much bigger, frankly. It's not a big, giant thing. It doesn't look much bigger than, um, you know, a cable, just a regular cable. 
man, that's a lot of bandwidth. A lot of it is what we call dark fiber. That is, it's not turned on. It's not lit up. And so that means we have all this capacity underground that isn't even used yet, but was put there in the ex exuberant 90s when we, uh, we had lots of cash to do that. That's good news. We're going to benefit from that. It raises the interesting question, though, and Ars Technica had a great uh, piece on that this week. Are we, is it, does it make sense, these bandwidth caps that the cable companies and the internet service providers insist they have to put in place because we'll just use way too much bandwidth if they don't? Well, there's a lot of evidence that, in fact, that is not the case. That, in fact, bandwidth is pretty much free. <laughs> And there's really no excuse except greed for companies to put bandwidth caps on your internet use. It's just a chance to make more money on it. Here's the reasoning. Because most internet service providers have what we call peering arrangements with other internet service providers, you know, they all have to interconnect or we wouldn't be able to see Netflix, right? Because that's coming from a different internet service provider to our internet service provider. But they have arrangements, peering arrangements to say, hey, look, you take our data for free, we'll take your data for free. That means the bits, the actual bits that you're getting don't cost the cable company hardly anything. In most cases, they're free. They're free bits. Oh, but we have to build infrastructure, they say. That's true. That's true. You have to invest, capital investment. That can, that can add up, but you do it once. And you can have a lot of capacity, as we know from this dark fiber. Once you've installed on that, you got all that capacity in there. You can just keep pumping more data into it without any cost at all. And so there's there's good evidence that bandwidth is essentially, you know, an incremental, a very small incremental cost to all that bandwidth they're using. And uh, I, I think this is important. It's hard to understand because we think of bandwidth, we think of bits as maybe like, I don't know, pork bellies or soybeans, like a thing that costs money but in a way but it's just it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't and really what's going on i think is uh, is greed and that kind of explains why in many uh, parts of the world they have better and faster and lower cost internet than we do we who invented it now the good news is most isps are kind of like, they don't want to acknowledge it, but they're acknowledging it by removing and raising bandwidth caps. Comcast just raised its bandwidth cap. A number of people, a number of internet service providers are eliminating bandwidth caps. So when the, when your cable company starts talking about bandwidth hogs <laughs> and saying you're using too much, you're watching Netflix all night, or when your internet service starts to degrade because everybody in the neighborhood is watching too much Netflix, you should go to them and say, look, dudes, you're making a lot of money. Let's let's improve our bandwidth. What do you say? It's bad. We have a couple of Australians in here. It's terrible in Australia, isn't it? You've got because partly because it was government run, and then they then turned over Telstra and these other companies to private industry, and you never got the investment that you really needed to to have good bandwidth. And if we think we have bad bandwidth caps in the states, it's worse in other countries, Australia and Canada. But then you look at uh, Scandinavia, where they're paying ridiculously twenty bucks a month for gigabit internet. And you go, why? How come? How? Why? How come? Isn't that the same bits? <laughs> yeah, it's the same bits. <laughs> What's interesting is where companies like Google come in with fiber and charge reasonable amounts of money. Suddenly, the cable companies find the ability to do the same. Oh, wait a minute. There's competition. Oh, oh, oh we better lower our rates. Competition is the best thing for this in general. The more competition, the lower the costs, the better the service. And uh, we got into all of this because the FCC allowed the cable companies to have a monopoly or sometimes a duopoly. It's going to get better. Better get better because, frankly, that's what powers the economy these days, isn't it? But anyway, all of which is to say our fiber optic was repaired. They spliced 216 individual threads of glass. That was hard. I actually was watching a video on YouTube of splicing fiber optic cables. It's not, it's non-trivial. It's a, they have to have a special machine. I don't know how they fuse the glass together, but they, because you don't want to add imperfections. 
You know, that's why it works. Because it's pure. So I'm curious. I don't know how they do it. But they did it. 216 strands. That's a lot. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? The DNS stands for Domain Name System. It's just a big phone book. When you surf the internet, you use words like yahoo.com. But your computer needs a number. They need the actual uh, address, the what we call the IP or Internet Protocol address of that website. 168.3.4.129 or whatever it is. It's always four numbers from 0 to 255, actually from 1 to 255, separated by dots. No, I guess it could be 0 in the, th in the last three positions. Separated by dots. So uh, that's a dotted quad, they call it. And that's, what, that's the phone number for a website. So uh, the DNS is just a phone book. You don't have to use your ISP's DNS. In most cases, uh, it's the fastest. What will happen when you enter in yahoo.com in your browser is your browser will ask the cache, because a lot of these are cached in your computer. Do you know that? Uh, and so, and then if it doesn't find it in its own cache, then it will ask the router. And if it doesn't know, the router doesn't know, it'll ask the ISP. If the ISP doesn't know, it asks the ISP's ISP. And it goes all the way up to the, the root domain servers. There are 13 of them around the world. That's it, 13. <clears throat> when you buy a domain, you're buying an entry in that phone book, your domain registrar will send it to one of those root servers and it'll propagate all the way down. Uh, and that's why it sometimes takes some time to propagate throughout the system so that everybody knows your address and your phone number. So can you use somebody else's? You can. You can use Google's. You can use, there's a company I like called OpenDNS at OpenDNS.com that offers their domain name servers. It's not necessarily um, better or worse. Some ISPs will attempt to use DNS to get ads into your system. So if you, <clears throat> for instance, and OpenDNS will do this too, enter, you know, instead of typing Yahoo, you type YHAH00 by accident, uh, and there's no address, nothing at, at that address, it will pop up, instead of the normal thing, which is there's nothing at this address, it'll pop up, here's some other things you might be interested in, which is an ad. And, uh, and there are other things ISPs might do uh, of a somewhat nefarious nature if you're using their domain name server. But they can do it to you anyway, by the way, because you're going through them no matter what. So if, what I would suggest is f using the fastest domain name server you can. Usually that is your ISPs. But there are DNS testers that you can run. My friend Steve Gibson, we mentioned him earlier, uh, has written one that will go out. It's called the DNS, uh, let's see, what is it called? The DNS, uh, I can't remember, benchmark or something like that. And it'll go out and it will go test a bunch of public DNSs. Remember, it has to be a public one so you can use it and see which one's the fastest. Yeah, if you, if you Google DNS benchmark, you'll find it at grc.com. So you can run this. It's a Windows program. You run it, and it will go through them all, and, and it takes a little while because it's querying them, querying them, querying them, till, and then it, figure, then it ranks them and tells you who the fastest is. If, if speed is the issue... Now, here's the issue. If, if the domain name server is flaky or unreliable or slow, that slows down everything because you enter yahoo.com, and now you have to wait till you get a res you know the, the lookups done and then you can go there and so a bad dns server can be a problem i would use your isps unless you know of a reason not to it's either slow yeah ironically a lot of people use verizon's because <laughs> they have they run a public dns server a lot of people use verizon's well i think it's 8.8.8.8 i can't remember but a lot of people use that so if you want it 8.8.8 is google right yeah what's verizon it's uh similar Anyway, um, I would just use, uh, you know, the, the, you, the one, first of all, everybody listening already is using your ISPs unless you've done otherwise. Because when you uh, set up your router or the ISP's router, it automatically uses theirs. That's, that's by default. So you have to explicitly enter something else. I like DNS, uh, OpenDNS, because they have other features like filtering and things that they can do. Um, that make them appealing to me. But I would check it out. Um, but there are lots of them. I think it's an interesting question. I, uh, it's a lot of times people are looking for tweaks. It's so funny because modern computers, really, you open the box, you plug them in, and, you know, they just kind of work, and you use them. 
But that bugs people. It's their, I mean, they're appliances these days. Nobody says, hey, is there a way I can, uh, I can soup up my toaster? Is there any maintenance I need to do to my toaster? Yeah, you clean the crumb catcher before it catches fire. That's about it. And so they, they want to do stuff to improve their experience because we used to have to. Nowadays, you don't really, you don't have to do a disk optimization or a defrag. You don't have to clean up temp files. You don't have to do any memory, you know, reallocation. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You don't have to change your DNS server, really. None of that. Just out of the box, the defaults are almost always the best to stick with. If, however, you notice you're having slow browsing, maybe one of the, run one of these benchmarks to see if it's your ISP's problem. And then you could change it to somebody who's better and faster. The reason your ISP is usually the best is because they're the closest to you. They're the first place you go on the internet. So if you use theirs, it's likely to be the quickest, unless there's something wrong with it. If there is, that's another that's another matter entirely. We like to we, we like to do things like clean up our registry, and usually that's a mistake. Usually. <laughs> <laughs> treat your nowadays treat your computers as an appliance, and that's one of the reasons I really love the Chromebook and the and the tablets, the iPad. They're just set it and forget it. They are totally appliances. You don't have to think about anything. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. The third annual Youth Dream Rig SA contest is now underway. The contest is sponsored by the Intrepid DX Group, a U.S.-based 501c3 nonprofit organization that promotes amateur radio activities around the world for youth. The contest is open to U.S. and Canadian amateur radio operators age 19 or older. The first place winner will receive a new HF transceiver. Second and third place winners will receive a handheld transceiver. To enter, contestants must write a two-page essay answering the question, how does amateur radio factor into your career plans? The submission needs to be in plain text, PDF, or a Microsoft Word attachment. Additionally, contestants must promise to use the radios on the air for one year and not trade, sell, or flip the equipment. The entry deadline is November 30th, 2022, and winners will be announced on December 15th, 2022. More information about the Intrepid DX Group is available at their website. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. The Radio Act of 1912 was hopelessly obsolete by the early 1920s. Conceived in an era of long and medium wave spark telegraphy, the Act was totally inadequate when it came to broadcasting and the short waves. The Department of Commerce gamely tried to stretch the Act to meet the new requirements. The 1922 and 1924 regulations that banned broadcasting by amateurs set up the broadcast band and carved out the 160, 80, 40, 20, and 5 meter bands were really nothing more than gentlemen's agreements, valid as long as they weren't challenged. For a time they worked. Amateurs enthusiastically settled in on their new bands and began working the world, while the number of broadcasters in the new 550 to 1500 kilocycle region jumped from 30 to almost 600 in just three years. Technical advances had not kept up with this growth, however, and there were problems. Crystal control of transmitters was still a couple of years away, and the unstable broadcasting stations drifted from their assigned frequencies, sometimes to the point of interfering with adjacent channels. Even stations off frequency by 400 to 600 cycles could cause ear-splitting heterodynes. Most receivers of the 1920s were either regenerative or TRF, tuned radio frequency, which were good on sensitivity and poor on selectivity. As a result, the 1920s broadcast band was saturated with only 600 stations. Compare that to today's medium wave where tight frequency control of 20 cycles coupled with directional antennas and selective superheterodyne receivers allows over 4,000 stations to occupy the AM broadcast band without undue interference. The Department of Commerce therefore issued regulations mandating such solutions as time-sharing, 
where two or more stations occupied the same frequency at different times of the day and daytime only operations. Stations were constantly moved to another frequency or told to decrease power in order to minimize interference. The department also went after stations whose transmitters drifted onto adjacent channels. An interesting example of this was the Los Angeles station of sister Amy Semple McPherson, an evangelist who was the leader of the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. Her station was notorious for drifting up and down the broadcast band. When the federal radio inspectors tried to keep her on frequency, she imperiously wrote to Secretary Hoover, demanding that his minions of Satan stay away from her transmitter. The Almighty would choose her wavelength, she wrote, not the Department of Commerce. Many of the stations that had been told to move, told to reduce power, or share their frequency did what any patriotic American would do, hire a lawyer. Once the legal bloodhounds began digging, certain things came to light. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution allows the federal government to regulate interstate commerce. Furthermore, it is an accepted fact that a federal agency cannot issue any regulations unless it was given the power to do so by Congress. Thus, the lawyers for the disgruntled stations challenged the Secretary's regulations on two fronts. First, that the Radio Act of 1912 gave the Department no authority to regulate broadcasting stations, and second, that since many stations could not be heard across state lines, there was no interstate commerce, and therefore no federal jurisdiction. This is the argument used by Radio Free Berkeley and other low-power pirate stations. The day of reckoning arrived in 1926 when an Illinois district court held that there was no federal law to permit the Secretary of Commerce to assign broadcasting licenses or frequencies. The Attorney General admitted that the federal government had no control over radio except what was specifically authorized in the 1912 Act. Pandemonium broke out. Stations, liberated from all federal control, upped their power, jumped frequency, and or began full-time operations on daytime or share time frequencies. Smaller stations were jammed off the air. Unlicensed transmitters appeared out of nowhere, dropped down on any convenient or inconvenient frequency, and began broadcasting. Anarchy was king. Amateurs, of course, could have legally joined in this RF orgy. There was nothing preventing them from getting back to broadcasting, moving to new frequencies, exceeding the one kilowatt limit, or anything else they desired. To their credit, they did nothing of the sort. One reason was the immense respect they felt for Secretary Hoover, a man who over and over publicly supported amateur radio in any way possible. They would abide by their gentleman's agreement with him. The other reason was common sense. They knew that Congress would soon rectify the problem by passing appropriate legislation. The broadcasters were big boys with a lot of money, powerful corporate backers, and six million listeners. They could afford to violate the spirit of the law and get away with it. Amateurs did not have this luxury. They realized that any violations of the 1922 and 1924 agreements, even if they were legally unenforceable, would cost them dearly in political support. So while the 550 to 1500 kilocycle segment was a free-for-all, the amateur bands were disciplined and orderly as hams mastered the art of crystal control and improved their operating skills. Incidentally, one area where these skills were honed was expeditions. From the Arctic to the Antarctic, from Macmillan to Byrd, amateurs provided the necessary communications of almost every major explorer. Also, in the area of emergencies, amateurs provided communications during snow and ice storms, hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. The federal government quickly moved to end the chaotic mess on the broadcast band. The Radio Act of 1927 was approved on February 23rd. This law defined amateur radio for the first time in a federal statute and created the Federal Radio Commission, which was given the power to classify and regulate all aspects of all radio stations for the public interest, convenience, or necessity. Criminal penalties were written into the 1927 Act for violations of the Act or any regulation thereunder. The Commission immediately went to work. Minions of Satan got Sister Amy's station back on frequency and shut down the transmitter of KFKB, the station of Dr. John Brinkley, graduate of the Eclectic Medical School and proponent of prostate operations and, get this, goat gland transplants to cure all medical ills. 
Patients by the thousands listen to KFKB's broadcasts and flock to Kansas to have the operations, picking out their goat from the pens next to the hospital as they went in. Do you think I could make this up? Unfortunately, after the commission shut him down, Dr. Brinkley went to Mexico by the Texas border, set up a 150,000 watt station, and continued his fraudulent operations. In regards to amateur radio, the commission, in effect, kept the status quo for the 15,000 hams. All agreements and regulations enacted by the Department of Commerce were maintained and incorporated into current regulations. The only change that hams noticed was the addition of a prefix on their calls. Thus, 1AW became W1AW, 1JS became W1JS, etc. However, the existence of a sympathetic commission and friendly regulations wasn't enough. Radio was truly international and, as a result, an international radio telegraph conference was scheduled in Washington, D.C. for October 4, 1927. Word was filtering out of Europe and the Far East that many governments were anti-amateur radio. How would our hobby fare at this conference? Join us the next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives has the answers. Foundations of Amateur Radio Yesterday, I finally discovered the missing piece of information that will allow me to create a project that I've, if not outright spoken about, at least hinted at. In an ideal world, by now, I'd have built a proof of concept and would be telling you that I've published a GitHub repository under my call sign for you to explore, if wishing made it so. Unfortunately, currently, sitting at a keyboard for anything longer than 10 minutes or so makes it nigh on impossible to stand up. So you'll have to make do with hand waving and gesticulation rather than actual code. But for now, that's all I have. Consider this a design specification if you're so inclined. So big idea. Imagine that you have a device that can listen to radio frequencies. This device is connected to a network and it shares the data to any number of different listeners, which might each do something different with the information. If you were to do this in the way we watch YouTube or listen to streaming audio, each listener would get their own unique copy of the data. If you have 10 listeners, you'd have 10 streams crossing your network, even if everyone was enjoying the exact same video or audio at the exact same time. Instead, I want the data coming from the device to have only one stream on the network, and for as many different listeners or clients to access it as required at the same time. Let's get specific here for a moment. I'm talking about using a software-defined radio, could be a $25 RTL dongle, could be any SDR, that is tuned to part of the spectrum, let's say the entire 40 meter band, and sends that radio information digitally onto the network. This network could be your local network, or it could theoretically be the internet. For now, let's just put it out on our own network. So, you have a copy of the entire 40 meter band streaming across your network. Great, now what? Well, imagine that you want to decode RITI on 7.040. You fire up your decoder, point it at the network stream and decode RITI. Then you want to decode a whisper signal at 7.0386. You fire up your whisper decoder, point it at the network stream and decode whisper. Then you want to decode FT8 on 7.056. Same deal, fire up your decoder, point it at the network stream and decode FT8. Now you want to compare two different RITI decoders. Fire them both up, point them both at the same stream, decode both, simultaneously. Of course, you could do this with CW signals, with SSB signals, with any decoder you have lying around. Olivia, Hellschreiber, AM, Packet, whatever. All these decoders could be running independently but together on the same band. You could add a tool that shows a waterfall display of the same data on a web page or play some of the decoded data to your headphones, or record it to disk, or do spectral analysis, all at the same time. The information that you're processing is on the network once. You don't have to flood your network with multiple copies of the 40 meter band. The only limit is how much CPU power you can throw at this, and to be frank, most computers on the globe today spend much of their time waiting for you to do something. So, Processing a bit of data like this is not going to tax anything built in the past 20 years or so. The missing ingredient for this was a Linux tool called Netcat, or NC. It allows us to distribute the information across the network using a technique called broadcasting. So, RTL dongle, 
data extracted by a tool called RTL underscore SDR, distributed across the network using Netcat, and used by as many clients as you can think of. The proof of concept I'm working on uses Docker to build a bunch of different containers, or clients if you like, that each can do a different task with the same stream. When I've got something to show and tell, you'll find it, predictably, on my GitHub page. Oh, and if you want to run the same thing for, say, the 80 meter band, you can. Now you have two network streams, one for 40 meters, one for 80 meters, and as many decoders on your network as you have CPU cycles to play with. If all this sounds like magic, you've seen nothing yet. Previously, I've spoken about the dynamic nature of your station. Even if, from day-to-day -day use, nothing changes, things around you are always in flux. Propagation changes, power fluctuates, and the environment in which your antenna operates is dynamic. Mobile stations even more so. A few days ago we had a gale come through, strong enough to do some major damage. Rip off some roofs, break some trees, cause flooding, cause power outages, plummeting temperatures. The first of the winter storms. Obviously, checking out your antenna after such an event is expected. Better still, stowing your gear before the event is even better. Such extreme weather events are an obvious trigger to attending to antenna health and well-being, not to mention maintenance and repair. The thing is, it's not the only time you should check out your antenna. Every day it's subject to change. The sun rises in the east, follows its path along the sky, and eventually sets in the west. The temperature and humidity change throughout the day, and continue to change through the night, and the next day it starts all over again. Peppered with sun, rain, snow, salt, corrosion, expansion and contraction, your faithful antenna sits there, ready for you to get on air and make noise. Until one day it isn't. You could just wait until it falls down dies, perhaps becomes a hazard to anyone within gravity range, not to mention destroy your radio when you key it up. Or you could check your antenna regularly and look after it, inspect and test it regularly, run your analyzer across it every couple of months, you know the drill. Most antennas are out of sight for most of their life, but they should never be out of mind. During the weekly F Troop Net, we started discussing this, as well as an in-depth conversation about launching wire into trees, and there were several suggestions worth investigating. One amateur pointed out that the level of complexity in the air dictates the amount of maintenance. A log periodic antenna on a rotator needs more tender loving care than a wire hanging off a tree. Another suggested that you should regularly check the tower supports, technically the mast supports. A tower is self-standing and a mast is not. The best way to remember that is the Eiffel Tower doesn't have any guy wires. Before a storm, if you have warning, you should check the supports, wind down anything that goes up and down, and you should think about how you're going to earth the coax. I've previously covered the weirdness that lightning and charge represents, even at a distance, so don't wait until it's overhead. There were suggestions of using spark plugs and mason jars, but I've got no supporting evidence either way. My geek background is sceptical, but I'm open to learning more. I've seen installations where a coax switch is used, where the antenna is switched to a shortened socket, so the inner and outer braid of the coax are connected to each other. One amateur suggested that an antenna tuner is cheaper than a radio, and that if you leave it in place during a storm, blowing that up is cheaper than blowing up a radio. But your mileage may vary. Also, if you have spare cash to burn, I'm happy to take your donation and relieve you of that fire hazard. It's interesting in and of itself that antenna maintenance is often discussed in terms of extremes, lightning, storm, wind, ice, etc., and less so in terms of regular maintenance. Finally, if you're only using a temporary antenna, you're not exempt from this. You're actually likely to have more failure, since the act of erecting and lowering the antenna is likely to cause more wear and tear. The antenna is the final part of the transmission chain, and it should be treated with the same respect as the power supply at the other end. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. This week's AMSAT report is in from Bruce Page, KK5DO. From the PICSAT team and U1SAT, we have learned that the PICSAT, a 3U CubeSat that was launched in January of 2018, 
went silent in April of 2018. That uh, CubeSat has come alive. First reports of the satellite were reported by Vlad EU1Sat on June 20th. Then on June 24, 2022, the PICSAT team reported successful commanding of the satellite. It has a 1K2 BPSK telemetry, and you can follow the recovery on their Twitter account at IamPICSAT. Hopefully, after the recovery, the FM transponder will be available. The Indian Space Research Organization is celebrating the launch into orbit of 36 Internet satellites from the London-based company OneWeb. The launch on Sunday, October 23rd, coincided with the Indian Festival of Lights, known as Diwali. An Indian GSLV Mark III rocket was substituted for the Russian Soyuz originally planned for the operation before the Ukrainian invasion earlier this year. This was the second flight for the Indian rocket, but its first commercial multi-satellite mission. The flight was overseen by the ISRO's commercial division, New Space India Limited. According to the BBC report, the latest launches mean that OneWeb, which is partly owned by the British government, is almost three quarters of the way to having its first generation satellite constellation achieve global coverage. The rollout is expected to be completed by the middle of 2023. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that solar activity perked up. The average daily sunspot number rose from 58.4 to 70.3, and solar flux averages increased from 113.3 to 129.9. Tad says that there are still problems with the Fredericksburg magnetometer, so Tad did his own rough estimates of middle-latitude numbers this week. The planetary A-index average went from 19.4 to 13.7, and middle-latitude estimated numbers changed from 9.1 to 12.6. So looking ahead, the solar prediction shows the highest values over the next week, starting with 135, 130, 135, 130, and 135 again on November 5th through the 9th. It'll be 115 on November 10th through the 12th, 112 on November 13th and 14th, 110 on November 15th, and then 108 on November 16th through the 18th. Taking a look now at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 20, 15, and 8 on November 5th through the 7th, 5 on November 8th and 9th, 18, 18, and 15 on November 10th through the 12th, 5 on November 13th through the 17th, and then 25, 15, and 8 on November 18th through the 20th. Just ahead in Radio Sport this week for November 3rd and 4th, it's the Walk for the Bacon QRP contest, that is CW. On November 5th, the IPARC contest, CW as well. November 5th through the 7th, the ARRL sweepstakes contest, that's CW. The IPARC contest, single sideband, that's phone. On November 6th, the High Speed Club CW contest, that's CW. On November 7th, the RSGB 80 meter autumn series data, that's digital of course. On November 8th, a couple of sessions, the Worldwide Sideband Activity Contest, phone, and the ARS Spartan Club, that's CW. On November 9th, the VHF UHF FT8 Activity Contest, FT8 there. And on November 10th, the EACW meeting. That, of course, is CW. And some upcoming section state and division conventions. November 5th and 6th, it's the Stone Mountain Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Georgia Convention. That's in Lawrenceville, Georgia. On November 12th, the Montgomery ARC Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Alabama State Convention. That's in Montgomery, Alabama. Also on November 12th, the Rock Hill Ham Fest hosting the ARRL South Carolina Section Convention. That's in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And on December 9th and 10th, the Tampa Bay Ham Fest hosting the ARRL West Central Florida Section Convention. That's in Plant City, Florida. According to the Reuters News Service, a tropical cyclone delivered deadly flooding and landslides in the Philippines in late October as dozens died and thousands of others sought shelter. Romy Isidro, DU1SMQ, chairman of the National Traffic System in the Philippines, said that Ham Radio Emergency Operations, or HERO, began monitoring emergency frequencies and awaiting further instructions. Romy said that reports from cities and provinces indicated that much of the traffic over emergency frequencies were from the various localities for flooding, commercial electricity, impassable roads, destroyed bridges, and requests for ambulance aid. 
When a wall collapsed, an amateur radio operator in central Luzon in Region 3 volunteered to relay word of that to the nearest disaster risk reduction office, which was already monitoring the emergency frequency. Romy said, however, that for the most part, casualties and fatalities were reported in very poor regions of the Philippines, where the lack of HF radios can complicate emergency communication. Offers of aid to the hardest-hit provinces came from the United States, China, Japan, and Australia. Most of you will have experienced RF interference problems of one sort or another over the years. Many will have noticed that the incidence and intensity has increased. In this world of advanced digital technology and increasing wireless connectivity, the probability of interference is high and increasing rapidly. This is giving rise to an ever-increasing pollution of the radio spectrum, which is threatening all wireless communication. To counter these problems, we need to make the relevant authorities aware by taking measurements and surveying any available documents and reports. With this in mind, the Radio Society of Great Britain is looking for volunteers who can help with this work. The RSGB EMC Committee has four main functions. To give members personal advice when EMC issues arise, to help prepare online leaflets and advice on EMC matters to help members, to keep an eye on emerging technologies and to investigate any potential threat to the amateur bands. Once a problem is identified, tests can be carried out to ascertain the severity of the problem and the less visible but equally important task of lobbying the regulators and influencing the standards bodies to ensure the views of radio spectrum users are factored in at an early age. With this growing amount of work, the RSGB is seeking volunteers from within the membership to assist the EMC committee in its work. It currently meets formally bi-monthly online, and the level of commitment outside of formal meetings can be as much or as little as suits you. Deep technical knowledge or experience of EMC work is not necessary, but ideally candidates should have a good understanding of radio. If you would like to help, please send an email of interest to emc.chairman at rsgb.org.uk. In preparation for the 3Y0JD expedition on Bouvet Island in early 2023, the team has announced the addition of pilots. According to the Ohio Penn DX newsletter, these hams provide a critical role as intermediaries between the D-Expedition team and the DX chasers. They'll be keeping an eye on propagation in their designated parts of the world to help facilitate contacts. The chief pilot and pilot for Europe is Morden, LA3MHA. North America's East Coast will be covered by Steve and 2AJ. The West Coast of North America will have Rich, KE1B, as pilot. South America's pilot will be CISO, HK3W. Hams and VK, ZL, OC will have Lee, VK3GK, as pilot. And in Asia and Japan, Hams will rely on CHAMP. E21EIC. The team expects to activate from the sub Antarctic island between January 13th and February 28th of 2023. ARRL Northwest Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO, presented the 2021 ARRL Technical Innovation Award to Steve Heinel, KF7O, creator of the Hermes Light Software Defined Radio. This long overdue presentation was made during the October 27, 2022 meeting of the Williamette Valley DX Club, said Ritz. The ARRL Board of Directors bestowed the 2021 ARRL Technical Innovation Award to Heinel during its September 2021 meeting. Heinel was cited as the instrumental and driving force behind the Hermes Light 5 watt HF software defined radio transceiver being a fully open source hardware and software project. More information about Hermes Light is available on their website. In an effort to ensure all homes have access to high-speed internet, New York State Governor Kathy Hochul announced Monday that the process of getting all addresses in the nation access to broadband internet has begun. The federal challenge process helps to better locate areas unserved or underserved by broadband and will help to ensure that high-speed internet is available everywhere. Affordable, reliable broadband is an absolute necessity for accessing work, education, and important government services, and we can no longer afford to treat it like a luxury. Thanks to our first-of-its-kind broadband mapping tool, we have a clearer picture than ever about New York's broadband needs, and we're better able to advocate for federal funding and program support to fill those gaps. 
My administration remains committed to ensuring that families and businesses are well connected to broadband, and I look forward to continued partnership with local, state, and federal authorities to make high-speed internet available to all New Yorkers, Hochul said. The state sent more than 31,000 addresses that cannot access broadband or have intermittent access. Broadband funding will be given to states in late 2023 based on the number of unserved or underserved homes and businesses in each state. Thanks to New York's broadband map, which was launched in 2021 and contained detailed information on the state's broadband infrastructure, the need for broadband internet was brought to light. Before the creation of the program, New York relied in part on federal data, which required providers to deliver service to only one address in a designated area, and that entire area would be considered served. This program will give more detailed information per household rather than just an area. So now if only one home in an area is receiving internet, the state will know that the area is not fully receiving broadband internet. Hochul's goal is to ensure every address in the United States has broadband internet access. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. If you've gotten the reputation for doing climbing work for hams, sooner or later the word gets out and you become everyone's friend. Some of your friends may have real need of your services on their towers and even on their roofs. Sometimes pleas for antenna help are hard to say no to. Here's how I handle those situations. If you're doing work for a close relative, do all the install work yourself and only use quality parts and install them to be bomb-proof so a return trip won't be necessary. But for upgrades or severe weather repairs, I use an approach similar to this. I tell them, sure, I'll do the job, but since my safety is the most important part of the job, if at any time I feel my safety may be in question, I will stop doing the job and they decide not to finish the work. For relatives, I never charge for tower or antenna work, but always tell them my safety disclaimer so if I stop, they know ahead of time why and agreed to my rules before the work started. This way, I'm never telling them no when they ask for my help. For hams in general, I tell them I will examine the tower first before I decide if I will do the job. When I get there, I examine the condition of the tower. I look at how it is mounted and the overall size of the tower, width and height. I do not climb those tiny TV antenna towers that are narrower than my two feet side by side. I tell the owner this before I get there. If the tower is bent at all or not perfectly vertical, I also decline the job. I have found that agreeing to look at the tower will save lots of guilt trips and sad stories. If you outline your criteria for rejecting jobs based on safety before going to see the tower, you can eliminate the dangerous jobs with a minimum of hurt feelings. When you do accept a job for a fellow amateur radio operator, take the opportunity to preach the gospel about safe climbing. Show them your belt and ropes and all your safety gear you've gathered over the years. I always keep mine covered in the back of the car so it's always ready to show. Just the sight of proper climbing gear impresses people the extent to which you value your personal safety. I take time to appoint someone to act as ground crew supervisor and charge them with keeping everyone far away from the base of the tower. If kids are present, I sometimes drop a screwdriver to impress them with what would happen to their heads if they hung around the base of the tower when something fell. While I'm on the subject of doing work for other hams, I'd like to mention a cheap and durable sidearm for the typical home antenna tower. I use inch or larger conduit and put a proper bend in one end, then clamp it to the tower. It is necessary to drill at least one hole and pin it to the tower to prevent rotating in the wind. I would ask a professional electrician to bend the conduit for me if you have no experience doing that yourself, since it is easy to kink it and ruin it. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Hams in the Slovak Republic are grieving the loss of a respected leader, Janko Slivka, OM3WZ, OM3WCF, the former president of the radio club OM3VSZ, who has become a silent key. His death was announced on a number of online ham radio forums and on Facebook. The club's current president, Vlado Ludorovsky, OM3TWM, remembered him as a radio operator who combined his love of amateur radio with his love of outdoor sports including cycling and marathon running. 
He also noted that Yanko was an enthusiastic CW operator. No further details were available at press time. And finally this week, a short story about a repeater that sure is enjoying its retirement. In the early 1960s, before the area had frequency coordination groups and standards for repeater offsets, a privately owned repeater went up on a place called Contractors Point, high above San Fernando in Southern California. The W6AQY solid state repeater, which operated on VHF FM, relied on the parts of a Motorola walkie talkie that it was built from. On the website eham.net, Paul, W0RW, said he helped install it on that mountaintop long ago with Jim, W6UJX, and Jim's father, facing the challenge of putting a 30-foot telephone pole in a trench in that rocky soil. The repeater itself was protected from the elements inside a waterproof Motorola truck mount box, and its batteries needed changing every three months. He said that the transmitter had an output of about 20 watts ERP and used a three-element beam turned towards Los Angeles, and it served all of Southern California successfully for much of that decade. It was finally taken out of service in 1969, and after some refurbishment, moved to Colorado, where it was put back to work, this time as WR0ACR. A half century later, it's still doing its job, but like most retirees, it's on standby service for much of the time. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the KD5DMT 145.290 and 443.025 MHz repeater system in Centerton and Garfield, Arkansas. Owned and operated by the Benton County Radio Operators Club, serving Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri, and Northeast Oklahoma. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you... A 73rd 